first is aimed at bringing some of the world leading scientists to the countries, just as Thailand, in which science and technology have just important roles to play the country's social and economic development. Today, we are uh, privileged to have with us at the fourth speaker in the series, the first lecture of the year, 2005. Mr. John Mary Lane of the College de France in Paris and the University of Louis Pasteur in Strasbourg. Uh, Professor Lane received the Nobel Prize for Chemistry in 1987. Before I introduce Professor Lane and his lecture, may I first call on the President of Chiang Mai University, Professor Kosa Kakasi, to formal start this morning closing with his open uh, address. Was, uh, the President, please. Mr. Robert Van Papen from the International Peace Foundation in Bangkok, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of my colleagues and myself, it is a pleasure to welcome you to Chiang Mai University on this most, most auspicious occasion. Professor Lin is recently also at the College de, de France in Paris and the laboratory director at the University of Louis Pasteur in Strasbourg. He was a joint recipient with both Donald Graham and Charles uh, Peterson of the year 1987 Nobel Prize for Chemistry for their contribution to the basic understanding of the molecular recognition processes that concern in the particular vital chemical function of molecules in living organisms. His lecture today will I am sure be a great source of inspiration for all of us. Professor Lin is with us today under the auspices of the second British dialogue towards the culture of peace. Nobel Prize Story and Lecture Series, a program which provides our staff and students with a unique opportunity to come face to face with some of the world's most distinguished scientists and internationally renowned authorities in the field of economics and international law. I would like to take this opportunity to express our gratitude to the International Peace Foundation and Thai Airways International. Without your support, today's lecture would be not possible. Also, to thank the Dean and his colleague of the Faculty of Science for the time and energy for him for they have to contribute to organize and hosting this event. Professor Lin, our most sincere thanks and appreciation to you for honoring our university with your presence. And we hope that the memories you take with you of our university and our city will heighten the return of your self and your wife in the, in the not too distant future. Thank you. Thank you, uh, President Bongsai. Uh, Bong <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, as I mentioned earlier, this new lecture is hosted by the Inter International Peace Foundation. Uh, the, the representative who is present today with us is the Robert Van Harpen. Well, we now come to the most important part of today's proceedings. This is the Nobel Laureate Lecture. Today's speaker, Professor John Murray Lane, received the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1987. This was in recognition of his outstanding work on supranormal chemistry. Professor John Murray Lane, as you might have heard from I already heard from uh, our president that he from France, actually his own child in Lost Town, France, Professor Lane studied at the University of Strasbourg where he earned a BA and PhD in chemistry 
1963. He began to work in the area of his of public chemistry and was appointed as a staff professor in 1966 and professor of chemistry in 1970. Since 1979, appointed as uh, a professor also in, uh, at the college, college of Front. Professor Lane research has been of great important for the development in the uh, within coordination chemistry, public synthesis, and recall chemistry, and bioinorganic and bioorganic chemistry, and have laid the foundation of the active interdisciplinary area of research within chemistry that he has held so far very grand. Chemistry. Listen, uh, his development of the work concerned the design of chemistry system, the chemical system, and growing cell organization, the basic process of uh, that leads to the emergence of the complex matter. He also completed important research in the area of artificial photosynthesis and the storage of chemical conversion of solar energy. Professor Lian has contributed scientific work uh, together with about 150 collaborators from over 20 uh, countries. Professor Lian has been a visiting professor at various institutions, for example, University of Cambridge, Arizona, Frankfurt. Professor Lian has been to Thailand many times and has collaborated or has collaborated with Professor Fajai of Tehran University and the former link with Dr. Ratana Maggi. Actually, both are uh, the former of, uh, former student of Chima Yushri. That indicates directly link between uh, Professor and our Chima Yushri. Well, actually, much more to say about uh, uh, the speaker today. I would like now come to the important part of this uh, session. So first, uh, uh, Len lecture today entitled From Method to Life, Science, and Society. Please, Johnny, give a warm welcome to Professor Len. Really, the universal culture among all the cultures. 
And uh, the spirit in which we function as scientists is also very important for the main topic of this series, which is peace. Peace is a word which has been used all over, which has been abused all over. And um, I think we can contribute to uh, better understanding between people and to peace by trying to teach our children, our students, our citizens, how education on one hand, but especially education in the spirit of uh, what we know is our huge trait, the spirit of rational approach to problems will suddenly contribute very, very much to the way in which we can help the world to become more peaceful. Now, since science, education in science, and progress in science is a major contributor to the development of mankind, we need, of course, to first support basic research. I know in many countries, be they developing countries or developed countries, one is pushing scientists more and more to application. In some respects, that is good. Because we also want that what we understand, the new knowledge we gain, will be useful through the technologies which can be developed on the basis of this knowledge. But the first quest is the quest for knowledge. And I think that's the drive of humanity, just to understand what we are, what is around us, where it comes from, and maybe someday where it's going to. So I think it is, for us, very important to support in all countries basic research and to help countries which are in the process of developing basic research to go up, to stand up, and develop it as quickly as possible. On the basis of this research, one can then hope for the development of efficient <coughs> technologies and one can make the point that high-tech developments will be of very much benefit for developing countries because the high-tech developments we have had in the last years, last 10, 20 years, are technologies which are using not so much raw materials, not so much energy. So high technology is a way to make everything more efficient. Of course, we still need steel. We need petrol, gasoline, and so on. But the high technologies which are being developed by scientists and through the science progress being made will make everything more efficient and therefore also contribute to sustainability and to conservation of natural resources, which are obviously limited because we're on the planet. Maybe there's some other planet somewhere where we can someday go, but for the moment, I think that's something which we should not really consider as a possibility in the near future. So, where is chemistry coming from? What can it contribute? The chemistry also builds bridges, as a, since chemistry is a science. And chemistry builds bridges between, of course, basic science and development. And technology, since you know that among the industries, chemical industry is one of the most basic ones for our everyday life. On the other hand, chemistry also builds bridges in our understanding of the non-living world and the living world. Living organisms are all built from molecules, are based on molecules, very, very complicated array of molecules. So chemistry can also provide the bridge between the non-living and the living world. So the bridge from matter, non-living matter, to life, living matter, can be provided and solely will be 
provided it by understanding better the way in which the chemical world functions. And I would like to bring you through this, starting really from the beginning and up to the research we are doing right now. Since I've seen the number of topics, for instance, we have now a recent topic, nanoscience and technology, a very actual type of field. We have, of course, chemistry, environmental science, geology, all the sciences are there. And I will try to show you some of the developments in chemistry and also maybe indicate some perspectives, which might be some perspectives, because only some, which might be available to the chemists. Can you perhaps switch off the other class? Thank you. That's nice. So I like usually to start when I give a general lecture, but Later on, we become more specific because I know there are more chemists here and we talk about chemistry. But let me start a bit broader first. What you see here, not make it bigger, but make it as big as possible. <laughs> so, um, obviously, a new universe has started as people right now think, 13.5 billion years ago to the Big Bang. At that time, there was no chemistry. There was only energy. And it cooled down very quickly. It was extremely hot. There were no particles. So it cooled down very quickly. And as it cooled down rather rapidly, particles formed. The particles then united to form atoms. The atoms, when it was cool enough, were able to make bonds molecules. The molecules, as they became more complex by processes, we are still trying of course, to understand, led to particle uh, <coughs> molecules, aggregates, these aggregates formed separations like uh, cells, the primitive cells, and at some stage, the mechanisms which we don't understand, but there is uh, a number of chemists uh, working in this area called prebiotic chemistry, where one tries to understand the step from non-living to living matter. Uh, this then went to uh, development of living cells, unicellular, polycellular organisms, and so on. And it developed eventually leading to one organism, which is human being. This is what we know right now. Now, one remark which I like to make usually because it puts things into perspective. When you look at this drawing, uh, you realize that there's a long history, there's a long development, that many things we still have to understand, of course, but also that it's not finished yet. And that what is here is not the end. So the human being is not the end of the evolution of the universe. I think we should be modest. We are not the end of the evolution of the universe. We will change. I don't know how. But something very interesting is that we can understand that. And we can ask ourselves what's going to happen next. And how can we further do it? This is something we could perhaps discuss today. So, chemistry has started when? Chemistry has started uh, when it was cool enough to make atoms and molecules. That's the start of chemistry. In this region here, where it was cool enough to make atoms and then molecules. Now, if we look at the features, or the main feature which has changed over the times, we could consider that it has become more and more complex. Things have become more and more complicated, complex. In other words, it looks like there is a property which we may call complexity, which, which is based on information which has become more and more important. And we can say that the evolution of the universe has sort of increased the information content. We could discuss that in terms of thermodynamics, entropy, information, mega entropy, and so on. We have time to do that. But going from living matter uh, here, if you go to start, at the beginning, matter was divided from divided, it became condensed, and 
then became organized, and then living and then thinking. And something else may be later on, which we don't know about. We don't know what is going to happen up here. Maybe something else. At any rate, this curve doesn't mean anything. The curve itself just means that it becomes more and more complex. And that is something, an evolution, which is of interest to try to understand. If we want to look at it in an evolutionary point of view, then this evolution of matter has occurred, one could say, under the pressure of information. You know that Darwinism is an evolution of living organisms <coughs> under the pressure of the conditions which surround that organism, adaptation of the organism to the conditions of the environment, and so on. In this case, we could look at a generalized Darwinism <coughs> by saying that the evolution has occurred under the pressure of something which is getting more and more organized, getting more and more complex, which can be called also being more and more informed. And so that the basic question we probably, as scientists, try to solve can be formulated. As scientists, we try to understand the universe from different approaches, from the laws which govern it, using mathematical formulation and physical laws, through the constitution of the universe, using chemistry, through the way in which this world has become living and thinking, through biology. And so the basic question which underlies these areas is, how has this happened? How has matter become complex? What are the processes by which progressively matter has become more and more complex. And if you want to have a long, wide span from the elementary particle to the thinking organism, it's a very wide range. And each of us in our efforts can contribute to this very basic question, which is, I consider, the basic question in science. The reason it's easy to justify that it's the basic question, because even the theory of relativity or quantum mechanics or the best mathematics and so on depend on this question because this evolution has led to the organism capable of formulating the mathematics, the mathematics of formulating the physics, of formulating the chemistry, and so on. The process by which this has happened can be, can be given a name but we do not know exactly what is behind this name. We have to try to fill it in. The name is self-organization. This is, this means everything and nothing. It's an, we understand it subjectively. We know what it, we understand it so in, in a very subjective fashion. But we have to fill it in. We don't know what is in it. At least we can progressively try to fill in meaning for this name of self-organization. And when I say meaning, I mean meaning in a scientific way. What are the processes by which it has happened? Self-organization can be considered, at least presently, since there's not yet a unified theory, from two perspectives. I mention it especially since this year, 2005. It's the 100th anniversary of what this is called the miraculous year, where Albert Einstein published three papers which all were revolutionary in their field. For the, for the electric effect, which led to quantum theory, the bone in motion effect, and the respective relative theory of relativity. So, right now, since there's no unified theory, there are still two ways we can look at it. At least I would like to draw a parallel. Physicists admit that the structuration of the universe results from the action of gravitational forces on small variations in density after the Big Bang. This led to the aggregation of matter and links to the galaxies or the stars or the next one. If you look at the molecular matter, so this leads to the cosmic structure. If you look at the molecular matter, Molecular matter is organized through the forces which link particles together, which link atoms together to make molecules, and more and more complex 
entities, and these are the electromagnetic forces, the same organization of molecular weapon that results from the action of electromagnetic forces. And as we see, these interactions, these forces are also the ones which lead to this generation of more and more informed entities. So chemistry can be the bridge between non-living and living matter. It is the science which deals with the structure of matter, how things are built up, what is the constitution, and the transformation of matter. How can you convert a given entity or molecule into another one? And as we you know, that that's a very important process. That's the way we make new materials. That's the way we make new polymers. That's the way we, way we make new nanostructures and all that. So this is a very basic and, in some respects, the main characteristic of the craft of the chemist to be able to transform matter. And finally, in fact, myself, I, I'm a chemist because when I was a youngster, I felt the power of that. The fact that you can put something in a flask and know that by the chemical rules, by the chemical reactions, you can produce something different from what you're doing and you know what comes up. You don't know always, but you try to know. <coughs> In fact, sometimes when you don't know, it's even better because you discover something. So we have then gone from the atom to the molecule. This is molecular chemistry, which has built up in the last 150, 180, 200 years by trying to understand how, by taking atoms, understanding their interactions, one can build more and more complicated molecules and transform these molecules into one another by well-established rules, procedures. Let me just mention two milestones which are showing how the development has happened and how far, how powerful this uh, ability to transform matter and to construct very complicated structures very complicated architectures, so we say complicated buildings, out of the bricks, which are the atoms. How this has come about? In 1828, Friedrich Böhler in Germany synthesized urea, a very simple molecule which is contained in living organisms, in urine. This was a very important step in chemistry. First of all, because it was a synthesis, a production of a compound, urea, from another one, ammonium cyanide. And secondly, because it also showed how the outlook on the world, let's say the philosophical outlook on the world, can be changed by scientific progress. At the time of Werler, people were thinking that anything present in a living organism can only be produced with the help of a living organism. This was called the vital force. We also showed that we could make urea, a compound contained in the living organism, from ammonium cyanate, a non-living material, inorganic compound. And that showed that there's no vital force, that this concept is a theory. And this was a very important change also in the way of looking at the world, especially the living world. It also showed that there is a bridge between the two. Living world, not living world. 150 years or so later, vitamin B12 was constructed, synthesized from the constituting elements. Vitamin B12 is a much, much more complicated structure than urea, and you can immediately see that starting from urea, 1828 to vitamin B12, 150 later, chemistry had evolved towards the science, which was, had become very powerful in the construction of very complex molecules. This is also contained in living organisms, and it took a long time to make it, about 120 men and women years. I can do it a little bit quick, when I was pushed off with Robert Woodward. There were two groups. This was also sort of a way in which scientists know that they are part of a group, a 
scientists by definition should be modest because we know that we all depend on the others. We all depend on the people that come before us and of course we have to bring our stone to what we have later on. So uh, two groups have contributed, the group of Robert Wilbur and Harvard and the group of Albert Hesham Mozart in the in Zurich. My work was this here. Yeah? This picture. there. But it's there, it's there. It's a small one, but it's there. <laughs> and it took a year to make it, this thing. <laughs> okay. So, of course, vacuum B12 is not the end of the road, and they have more complicated molecules have been made, many groups, and you know, all of you are the ones who are organic chemistry, and they know very well that organic chemistry is still from the growing. And molecular chemistry, the art and science of making more and more complex organic architectures is of course still continuing and will lead to new reactions, new processes, new technologies, new materials, new many things, new drugs and so on. And this is a very important development still ahead of us. But you come down to a stage where you nevertheless can ask the question beyond a molecule which you can consider like a building. What is there? What is there? What is there? And what else can you try to study? And of course, beyond the single molecule, there is the idea of assemblies of molecules. To introduce that, let me first go through some biological examples, and then we think about them and see what we can deduce from what they tell us. What you see here is a blue sphere, which is a cancer cell, a tumor cell, and uh, two other violet colored bodies, which are killer cells. These killer cells are cells which in our organism are doing the uh, policeman job to find what goes wrong and then to destroy it. And uh, this is not very peaceful, but it's good in this case. <laughs> so these cells will find, or hopefully, hopefully will find, the don't, you are trouble, will find the cancer cell, detect it, and destroy it. They should, of course, not make a mistake. Not. They will destroy healthy cells, or they will destroy nothing. This body is a white blood cell. It has been colored or in rose, just to make it look nice, I suppose. And this white blood cell has blue dots. And these blue dots are the AIDS virus. This virus is sitting on the white blood cell. It's going to infect it. How does this happen? How does the virus go into the cell? Let's even how does the virus know it's a white blood cell? If you look at the structure, very schematic structure of this AIDS virus. You see here a shell, a membrane, which is the membrane-like cells usually. So this is the shell. Inside the shell is the genome of the virus, the genetic material of the virus. And in this membrane are sticking molecules, which are represented by simply these blobs here which are large proteins, and these are the tentacles of the virus. It is through these tentacles that the virus feels the white blood cell or the other cells, finds the target, binds to it, and then infects. The first interaction happens to this molecule called GP120, Glycoprotein. For those who are chemists or biologists, they know that. And on the white blood cell is the correspondent, the target, which is called CD4. And when GP120 binds to CD4, it initiates the process of invasion, of infection of the cell. I could have given other examples. When you receive a vaccination, your body generates antibodies which are directed given, against given antigens in a very selective fashion. These antibodies will recognize, will find, and 
neutralize a given antigen. So, if you think about what happens in these processes, knowing that the bodies I showed, the cells, the virus, the antibody, are molecules, and the contained molecules are formed of molecules, we realize that what is important here is the interaction between the molecules, the way one body interacts with another one. Therefore, we here look not at the molecular structure of the entities, but at the way in which these molecular structures interact with one another. So it has to do not with the level of the molecules in an isolated state, but with the molecule in a state of contact with others. And this can be called then supramolecular chemistry, because it's the level above in complexity of molecular chemistry. You have already understood, of course, from what I said, that supramolecular chemistry is therefore a chemistry which lies beyond the molecule, further ahead on the axis of complexity, and then leads to the is based on <coughs> non-covenant for the chemist here, it's clear, for the non-chemists, atoms are bound in molecules by strong bonds. Once these are formed, molecules can interact through weak interactions, and those are these intermolecular bonding interactions, which then make up the larger aggregates formed on the basis of molecules themselves. If we wish to recognize, in other words, if we wish to explain the way in which a molecule can bind selectively to another one, we know that this implies a process which we can call recognition. And this is, can be termed a molecular recognition. The way in which a given molecule selectively finds, binds to another one. Now, such molecular recognition requires, of course, an interaction energy, forces to bind. But in addition, something else. It also needs information. If you have no information, you have no selection. Which means that the process of molecular recognition implies not only the contact between the objects or some interaction, but also the fact that this contains information. So molecular processes based on selective binding, like what happens in most in biomolecules, which I mentioned already, or in the binding of a drug to the biological target, same thing, in order to be specific, you need to selection when it's information. The simplest way of Describing this information and this recognition process is to call it a complementarity process where one object binds to its complement. This complementarity is, of course, both geometrical and interactional. The nicest picture, or the strong picture, the first time this process has been really uh, expressed was already in 1894 by Emil Fischer, when he said that um, substrate binds to an enzyme when they fit together like a lock in the key. This is a very, very nice image, a simple image, a strong image. Of course, it, the lock has become a bit soft, it can adapt and so on. But basically, the lock and key idea is still a picture, an image, which is a very good one to understand the basics of these processes. And here is Emil Fischer. <laughs> I'm very happy to show him because he got his PhD at our university in Strasbourg. <laughs> at the time when we were German or French. <laughs> well, that's history. Now, information. Let me give you an example which most of you know, but I guess now to some here who may not know it. Anyway, it's good to use it to just illustrate information. And of course, 
everybody knows that the double helix of DNA is an information system. Let's just analyze it rapidly. That's the double helix. One strand, the other strand, one linked together. Okay. Let's look a little bit more detail in it. If you look in more detail, we find that, as we know, this information system is working with four letters, four molecules, four molecular groups, very, very important ones, adenine, guanine, uracine, or thymine, and cyanide. These are four letters. These four letters write the genome of all living organisms. It is this, this sequence of these four letters which makes a difference between an elephant and a mouse, or the human being and the bacteria. Uh, the storage of the information is a sequence of letters. These letters are very, very arranged in very, very, very long sequences, as you know, in the DNA strands, in the chromosomes. And uh, the storage, therefore, is molecular. The storage is, of the information is in the sequence of molecular groups. The reading of this information is by interaction. And these interactions can be two interactions or three interactions. So simple. But this reading is supra-molecular. It is not molecular. It's not covalent. It's just taking a sort of touching. Two or three, or two or three, or two or three, and reading the sequence in that way. It's a very, very simple information process, but it's the most complex we right now know, at least as the storage goes. There's an enormous amount of information stored, which is then being read out and then processed. Let me just show you that as a professor or biology have seen it, these things. <laughs> sort of impressive, it's only a very small part of the human genome. That's chromosome 17 here, 16 here, 17 here, 18 comes somewhere down there. One also knows, just for, of course, again, that's something which is a bit surprising, but we in our way, Chromosomes use only about 20%, the rest is about the spike. Probably some dinosaur there or something like that. <laughs> now, maybe it's not bad, but we begin to understand that maybe in what I consider as the non coding type, they also have important functions. This is a bit of a better look at the chromosome 17, 1 million, 2 million letters, and so on and so on. So on, so on. Okay, so. This means that this is a molecular information system. A molecular information system where one stores the information in the molecular structure, one reads the information in the supermolecular way by a very simple, in this case, very simple process, which is a binary process. Two interactions of three, two, three, two, three, two, 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 three, two, three, two, three, and so on. Just for the fun of it, in Asia, this was discovered before Watson and Crick published their famous double helix paper in 1953 uh, in Nature. Uh, that's, let me show you what the Chinese did much before. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's rather strange, of course, that, had, that these people had no clue what of DNA was. But nevertheless, <laughs> They had an interesting double helix, as you can see. <laughs> if you look closely, you even see the base pairs here. If I want to push it. And furthermore, you have everything you need to transfer to transfer DNA, yes? What do you need to transfer DNA? A man and a woman. That's the best way to propagate DNA, yes. And it's one of the ways. <laughs> Alright, so. The conclusion of what I just said is that chemistry is a science of informed matter. It is not just a science of uh, objects. And this is also something which I like to point out for young students. Everybody is so excited about computers, information technology, and all that. But what I do is a much more complex in terms of information processing and handling and so on. So, the storage is molecular, the processing of information is super molecular. Question now, 
how can you understand this? I showed you one example, but this example was very simple. It was just an interaction, linear usually, by a hydrogen bomb, as chemists call it. Can, can we, in more general terms, try to understand molecular recognition? This then led to the development of supermolecular chemistry on the basis of molecular chemistry. Molecular chemistry constructs cannabis construct locks for given keys. In other words, we cannot play the game. Let's see. We know that the lock and key principle is a basic principle of recognition. Let's now see how we can construct a lock for a given key and therefore understand what's going on. So we can try by the same organic synthesis to make what one may call a receptor entity, which we bind the substrate using these non covalent bonds. This leads to supramolecular entities, which have a number of functions. The basic function is recognition of one by the other. The two others, which I have not time to talk about, have to do with the one transforming the other one, and another case where one receptor is able to transport the substrate. This I will mention later. And once this is understood, we can try to use the knowledge we have gained on the processes of molecular recognition to generate systems capable of self-organization. And I will try to give you some examples of that. What about molecular recognition? Log and key idea, with a few words in French, but easy words. Look at the lesson, free lesson in French. <laughs> only a basic lesson, not very advanced. If this is the lock, and you have a set of keys on the left, it's quite clear that the red key is the one which fits. So let's do the following, which is a scientific process. We first simplify things and then build up more complexity again when we understand the simple ones. The most simple substrate available in the three-dimensional world is a sphere. In the three-dimensional world is nothing simpler than a sphere. And then the question can ask, what are the spheres of chemistry? And then can we play can we play balls? Can we play spheres and recognize them? The spheres, we as chemists know, are those a series, a very nice series of bowling balls, huh? smaller ones to larger ones, going from this to cesium. That's the series of the in the left table. Two of them are very important for organisms, living organisms, sodium and potassium. That was one reason also why this was an interesting series, since the propagation of the nerve in flux along the nerve rests on the change of concentration of sodium and potassium across the membrane. So there are molecules there which are able to make the difference between sodium and potassium. And there are two spheres which are quite close. Sodium has about one angstrom radius and potassium 1.3 angstrom radius. Only 30% difference. And there are molecules are able to distinguish them. And if they don't, you have a short circuit in your nerve. That's not a good thing. So they have to do it. So you can play with this and say, okay, if these are the keys, what kind of locks are we going to make? Obviously, if you are a good disciple of a fissure, we see the lock has to be cavity, spherical, and the size has to be adapted to the bottom of the bit. So we start this. We call those crypts and cryptates. So this that's not so easy to see. Molecules which are cavity, spherical one. We made those long, long time, long, long ago now. This is the first one which was made. I showed you a and Jan Dietrich in their PhD thesis. That is the crystal structure. As you know, the crystal structure is the real image of a no, it's the real structure that molecule in crystal as determined by X-ray crystallography. So this is the real reality as it is. Rubidium in this case goes in and sits in the middle. So, indeed, it fits, but how can we control the selectivity? In other words, adjust the log so as to bind different keys. 
it's quite clear that we can do that by changing this, the length of the bridges. If these bridges change in length, then the cavity goes in order of larger. It's as simple as you make accordion on the molecule. You can do that, and then you get this, where you have the smallest cavity here, the somewhat larger one, and the larger one. Here there is lithium inside, sodium inside, potassium inside. These are all models which are in scale, as one knows. And indeed, when these are made, tested, you find that this is the sequence of binding selectivities, which is also the real sequence. And so you begin to understand how spherical recognition can be performed. Let me give you one example, somewhat a little bit more complicated object, a tetrahedron. A tetrahedron is, of course, for a chemist, something which is a very important type of structure. And the simplest tetrahedron with a charge is the ammonium ion, NH4+, represented here. If you want to, if you have a tetrahedron key, you have to build a lock which has a tetrahedron disposition of binding sites so you can anchor to it. This can be done in a way. One, two, three, four blue dots. This represents nitrogen sites. The red ones are oxygen cells because they add some electrostatic interaction, electric interaction, and the ammonium tetrahedron is in the middle. So this molecule has to be made, constructed. Here is the molecule which was made which uh, has these four points in tetrahedral positioning. It's not evident here, but it is the four located as the tetrahedron is. And if you now add ammonium ion to that, it goes into the cavity and forms this nice complementary project. <coughs> this is also an illustration for the chemist, the chemist and organic chemist here of the difference between molecules and supermolecules. This entity is constituted by the exterior receptor, the substrate inside. When they are separated, these are two molecules, and when they get together, they form something new, which has different properties. Different properties from the separated entities. This is what we call a supermolecular entity. That's the simplest, the simplest case, perhaps, with very nice complementarity in geometry, size and shape, and in interactions also between the ammonium here and these other nitrogen sites. You don't see the last one, it's behind. So people have been continuing this, and molecular recognition is better and better understood along the way, and uh, one has made more and more complex entities which uh, use them just a whole collection of these entities that we made. This is just a small selection of different entities which have been produced and studied over the years by many laboratories around the world. Let me just give you an example of how research, which, as you can see, was at the beginning mainly aimed at understanding the processes of recognition, can also be of applied interest can lead to interesting applications. An entity, uh, one of those cryptates, is crypts, cabins, cavities with something in it. Uh, a modification of the original ones was this one, which we made in the 1980s, 80s, and so on. Where they are the walls still of the cavity, but now inside there is another type of ion which is called the Europium ion. And this is known to be fluorescent and has a red fluorescence. So this entity now is like a Chinese lantern, you know, one of those red lights which hang in the streets. <laughs> <laughs> and you can use this as a label and then look at it for following it as a label of biological substrates. Now by a series of processes that we just showed you 
But this is a control. This is the fluorescent activity, which I just showed you. And by a series of developments, which took many years, and which were performed by uh, Dr. Giamatis and his group at the company, they developed a way to use these labels for as a diagnostic tool. Let me just show you how this works. This is just an example. So, as you can see here, this is, this is the antigen. It's a, it's a tumor necrosis factor, which you want to detect. And the process developed is quite interesting. You make an antibody to one site of the target antigen, and you label it with the cryptate. You make an antibody to another site, and you label it with another secondary acceptor. Then by a process of energy transfer, when both of them attach to the antigen, energy transfer can occur to this and that is immediate here. In other words, if the person you want to diagnose is not sick, is healthy, then this is not present and this process does not occur. But when the antigen characteristic of a given sickness is present, then this process occurs in the transfer and you can detect the fact that the antigen is present. This is then a way of doing medical diagnosis, for instance, of uh, cancers. And this led then to an application, which is this apparatus, which is now used in hospitals, where one uses this little light emitting unit, this European cryptate, to generate this secondary emission and therefore the diagnosis. Another example, which, uh, so this was a case of something which developed totally independently of what you wanted initially to do. And I think it can be also seen that our initial aim was purely understanding monetary commission. And a spin-off was the development by this group, uh, this company, of this kind of technology. I have mentioned very briefly transport processes through membranes. This is another case where the work we had been doing in the beginning 70s on transporting things through membrane, helping a substrate to go through a membrane, led to developments which could not be predicted at that time. The basic process is this one. The membrane is a barrier, like a cell membrane, which regulates what goes in and out through specific proteins and so on. And you can imagine devising, designing a carrier object which you pick up one substrate on one side and it is through. In other words, it would pick up this substrate, diffuse through, release it and come back, sort of shuttle back and forth. This was done in detail, we studied lots of this, and okay. Then 15 years later, 20 years later, the question came up of the transport of a very specific new type of substrate which had not been considered before, simply because that field of biology had not developed enough. This is the transport of a piece of DNA, of a gene, into a cell for gene therapy, for gene transfection. What you want to do is to take a piece of DNA to help it go into the cell so that it then is transcribed and generates the proteins which you want to generate. This does not happen spontaneously because DNA is very water soluble, it does not want to cross membranes, so you have to help it. You have to help it to go in. And the basic process is that the DNA has to get in. Once it is inside the cell, then the next step is to go into the nucleus and then to be transcribed. It's many, many complicated processes. But the first step is just to go into the cell through the membrane barrier. And for doing that, one can try 
the device molecules which are charged. You know that DNA is negative. Uh, for those who don't know, DNA is a negatively charged molecule. And then you have to make something to compensate the negative charge, something positive. And in order to get to the membrane, you want to make it hypophilic. You want to make it greasy. So you want to make molecules which are cationic lipids, which then bind to the DNA, lead it to the cell, and then the other processes occur. This we developed a number of them. I don't want to go into details of this. All the structures that we just show you, since I'm chemist here, this is the structure of it. The best one we have made, at least one of the best ones, is this one, which combines cholesterol molecule, which is of course present in membranes, with two of these positively charged residues, two many minions. That's for the chemist. This is quite an efficient way of binding. And then the result is the following. You can then use the gene for, you can call it a reporter gene, a gene which will generate a protein which is easy to detect. This protein can be, for instance, an enzyme like beta galactosidase which allows the uh, dehydration that is needed. Then, of course, and I think I should make a point of this. There is a lot of theory that goes into this work. I mean, also I show you nice common pictures of proteins. What really happened in my lab over the years is that theoretical physicists would develop equations would analyze equations, would then write algorithms, would then write software programs in order to make the practical use of the model. So it's a quite an interesting process where the bricks recognize each other, physical chemically. You should not forget that there may be another possibility. Let me just show you that. These are possible architectures, very schematically represented, which might be able to generate. As you see, they look like electronic circuitry. When you, when you forget that I'm talking to you about chemistry, it looks like electronics. It's like an electronic circuit. Can we generate structures like that? Of course, the most complex is this one, what we call a grid, where molecules are headed this way, and where perhaps you can address the different points that you can store information. If possible. Just to illustrate that, let me show you this is a case where it can be done. If you make molecules of this type, which have binding sites here for metal ions, then if you treat them with the correct connector in it, then they will assemble by making hair. It has two sides. It makes two by two. It has three sides. It makes three by three. It has four sides. It makes four by four. Does this work? It does work. And uh, I'll just show you the first one. This is a, uh, a ligand with two sides. If you treat it with nickel, iron, cobalt, zinc, and so on, continuously you get an organization into the system with these four sides. These are also interesting magnetic, optical, electrical properties, which I don't want to mention, but just to say that they do exist. Larger entities can be obtained <coughs> here with four sides, where you can then just you just mix. You have nothing else to do. You just take, in this case, lead ions. Lead two. The molecule has to be made, of course, and you synthesize it, and then you mix it and you spontaneously get this object here. Now, this is not useful at the moment, but it shows that it's possible. 
to make this very nice array. If you look at the structure of this array, the real one by crystal structure determination, this is just the 16 dots, the 16 legs which are sitting there. And I show you that just in order to compare it with this, which is a microfabricated array of what is called quantum dots using semiconductor materials, gallium arsenide in this case. As you can see, this object which has been fabricated, it's, it's a very nice object, it's fantastically nicely made. You see the power of these micro lithographic techniques, nano lithographic techniques shown here. It's very nice, splendid object. But you have to make it. You have to make it. And as people know in the electronics industry, the smaller things get, the more difficult, the more expensive, the more careful you have to be in your fabrication. And there is a limit in size at some stage. Secondly, this is a thousand times bigger than this one. In size, the distance between the dots is about a thousand times more, five hundred times more. So, this makes itself by just mixing on the bench. It is five hundred thousand times smaller. Of course, for the moment we cannot address it. But I just wanted to illustrate the fact that probably in the future, the approach which makes use of the ability of chemical systems to undergo a programmed self-organization is an approach which can be very powerful for the development of these technologies. In other words, rather than performing nanofabrication or nanomanipulation, you can think of doing self the system makes itself if it is well designed. And I'm pretty sure that in the future we'll understand better and better how to design the sense. Right now, obviously, the pathway, and I think in the future too, the pathway of fabricating, nanofabricating is a very important one and will be, must be pursued, obviously. But I just want to make the point that one should think about the ability of chemical systems to self-fabricate. Now, in material science, supermolecular chemistry also can contribute quite strongly, and since I know that uh, it's quite a strong group of polymer chemistry here, I would like just to illustrate, mainly for them, but also for the other organic chemists who may be around, uh, how Supramolecular approaches to material science can also be interesting. So molecular materials, these are materials made of molecules, and when you consider mostly the molecule, and supramolecular materials where it is the interactions between the molecules which constitute the connectors which give properties to the material. And just to illustrate very briefly what is happening, in, there's an area which has developed the last 10 to 15 years, which is called supramolecular polymer chemistry, where the difference between normal polymer chemistry, normal polymer chemistry, you take monomers and you connect them with chemical bonds, covalent bonds. In this case, you connect them with non covalent bonds on the basis of recognition process. So it's a sort of a selective process of doing making polymers. They result from the fully association of complementary monomers which are connected through these non covalent interactions. And let me just give you one example, see what will happen is this. This is a building block, that's another one. Of course, this and this are complementary. They can fit into each other and then link together and make a chain. This is indeed what can be done. And I just give you one example, not more. It's a bit of a complicated example, but the basis is simple. The basis is this unit is the complementary unit to this unit here. By having three interactions, this can be interacting with this, forming these three dotted lines, these three hydrogen bonds, 
And when you mix these two substances together, they form a chain by interaction through this hydrogen bonding unit between this and that. And as a result, you get a very long chain, a fully invariant chain, which has very different properties from the starting materials. This material is a solid. This material is a solid. When you mix it, you get a liquid crystal. And I just show you the electromicroscopy of that. These are the fibers which you get. You get very nice, very long fibers where the molecules attach to each other and form electron fibers. So this is just an indication that in the area of materials science, using systems designed on the basis of supermolecular interactions can also be very important for the future. So, if we want to come back to some of the general remarks I made at the beginning, let me conclude the following way. If we compare matter, non-living and living matter, on the basis of a very important parameter which we define as the com progressive complexification of matter in the universe, and on the other parameter using the number of possibilities that exist, the diversity, biology is dealing with the most complex systems we know of living systems, thinking organisms. But the biological entities are based on classes of molecules. They are very diverse, but nevertheless they are classes. Because when evolution started and then led to more and more complex living organisms, it didn't try too many times to go back and try again. Maybe in the beginning it did, but once it had found that way then it was using the same thing all over again. And as you know, all the enzymes are all made of amino acids and they are all uh, the same category of compounds. So you have proteins, you have nucleic acids, you have sugars, you have lipids. This is the biological world, which used these basic building blocks in an extremely inventive, I don't mean, think maybe under the pressure of having to do it because otherwise it would die out. So uh, it uh, makes these very complex systems, but on the basis of classes of molecules. And for instance, obviously, genome, DNA, is universal. It's one class of molecules, and it's been very simple. Diversity is therefore limited to classes. Chemistry has no such classes. Chemistry can, in principle, make any molecule that is allowed by the basic physical laws. So, no limitation. Just you can let your imagination go and make the entities. Some may be interesting, some may be uninteresting, but you can make them if the basic physical laws makes it possible, allows it. On the other hand, the complexity of the chemical systems is still very low compared to the complexity of the biological systems. And we have then to progressively improve our possibility, understand better construct more and more complex systems and progressively build up this complexity which will then give us an idea of how one can make systems of highly complex nature. The two fields in fact are evolving in a rather interesting fashion. Again chemistry provides an interesting handbook. For those who have followed it but they know about but for the others I may just tell you that right now what some people are doing, of course chemists are trying to become more and more complex, okay? and making more and more complicated systems. Biologists are trying to be more diverse, but again, these biologists are chemical biologists. What I mean by that is, for instance, some people are trying to add other letters in the genetic alphabet. Right now, there are four, and in Ingrenin, Cytogen, Simon. But some groups are trying to add a fifth letter or a sixth letter, read it differently, in other words, Try to see if in the molecular biology machinery in a cell you can introduce new letters. And if you can introduce new letters, these new letters will do something different. So you can change your organisms. Not just by genetic engineering, 
but by basically rewriting the genetic code. That is chemistry. Because it's rewriting of the genetic code. It's rewriting of the alphabet in the genetic code. It's by using other molecules. And this is something which is, I think, quite exciting. What will come out of it, I don't know. But very exciting. So this is an illustration of uh, also what has been said many years ago by somebody who would certainly consider at the same time as one of the great scientists and the great artists of all times. Leonardo da Vinci. And uh, he wrote this very nice sentence. For those who know Italian, you can read in Italian on all. <laughs> For the other ones, it's written in English. Where nature finishes to produce its own fishes. Besides what is produced by natural evolution. Man begins using natural things. It's the atoms we have around, molecules, generating new entities. In harmony with his very nature, this is uh, the simplest uh, way of phrasing this, is to say that according with the laws of nature, obviously the Coulomb equation, quantum mechanics, and all these kind of things. And then comes a very important part, which is something which for an artist has a lot of meaning, but for a scientist too, to create an infinity of species. It is indeed the ability of science to generate entities which did not exist before and which were not produced by the natural processes. This makes me again try to build a bridge, since we speak about bridges, between science as one part of our culture and art, which is obviously something which people consider more a culture, but I, like many of my colleagues and fellow scientists, consider that science is as much a culture of art as art is. One can look at this sculpture of the French sculpture of Buddha, but the hand of the artist expresses out of a stone, a sculpture which was not contained in a stone. Or when the composer writes a piece of music using sounds, which do not contain a piece of music. Or when a writer writes a novel with words which do not contain the novel. In the same way it is possible through the understanding of the basic functioning of the laws which govern the universe and of the construction, the generation of objects which were not yet made and which we can more and more make in more and more complex fashion. We can consider that it is this possibility which gives us the ability to create new words in the universe of all the possible words. The word we know of is one which has been realized, but there may be many others. And I think this is one reason why it's nice to be a scientist. But coming back to the beginning also, in addition to this, in addition to our way of uh, trying to develop our own field, in other words, our profession, we have also another duty, which is to try to teach the scientific approach. When I say let's even drop scientific, let's say the rational approach to human problems. And I guess there also we will have an establishing piece of the world. Thank you very much.
Well, before uh, going to the uh, uh, question session, you know, just to uh, make sure that some of our students uh, may not uh, miss the uh, main point of the lecture, I would invite, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Bekintat Rukiwat to summarize the lecture of the main points again in our uh, language. I hope it was the main uh,
than what we see today. Well, uh, you know, uh, now I think it's the time for questions from the audience. Well, I mean, uh, some of the students may not, uh, you know, I mean, may take time to, to, to press up the time to English. So I think I'm going to be time and myself try to, you know, uh, have a translate, uh, translation of the Thai to English uh, so that Professor Lin can answer uh, the question. So please, now the time for the uh, question. Please. Well, uh, first of all, Professor Ling, I'd like to congratulate you on your great achievement today in uh, holding you know the audience attention throughout from the first minute until the, the last minute. It's been the most inspiring uh, lecture of the year. You tell me about that. But <laughs> <laughs> well, that's yeah, that's the beginning of the year. But I'm sure this is going to be a, a record, which is very difficult to, uh, to break. Well, uh, since uh, Dr. Rimsi and I attended your, first, uh, your lecture uh, at, uh, you know, at the World Kimsey Congress uh, at Brisbane, I recognize that part of your lecture uh, arose from that. And I also have read your uh, Nobel lecture in 1987. Yeah, part of the skills uh, I think from your uh, lecture there. So up to now, uh, uh, do you still believe that uh, super molecular chemistry will be the gateway to open up the uh, understanding of uh, human life. Um. Oh, I don't think trans I don't think that should be imperialistic in that fashion. <laughs> Supermolecular chemistry is a step in further in molecular chemistry in more complex systems. It is quite clear that uh, living systems are based on interactions, and that is a very important part. But altogether. <coughs> Life is based on these molecules. How you go from a living system to non living is a question of uh, how you define life, which is culturally really metabolism, reproduction, and uh, transmission of factors. And maybe I can give an example which sort of shows where a borderline exists, about borderline, where for the moment, one can see the change from living, from non-living to living. I mentioned the virus. The virus. The virus is not living. It does not live. When the virus is not in a cell, it is not living. It cannot reproduce itself. It's just sitting there. So a virus outside the cell is a bunch of molecules. Then, by physical chemical methods, uh, interactions, it penetrates the cell. It then uses part of the machinery of the cell, some enzymes, which it needs to reproduce itself. And then you may say that it lives, because it reproduces itself. So, a virus is just at the border between an inert assembly of molecules and a living set of molecules. And what is lacking? It's just some enzymes which allow this reproduction. It would be very exciting, and I hope that some people are working on that, to take a virus, put it in an artificial, in fact, if I have the time, I will, we will do it, put it into an artificial liposome, you know, an artificial physical, and add the enzymes which the virus needs from the cell and see if it works. That can be it. I, I, I think I'm going to give this microphone to other uh, people because uh, uh, I still can ask you later on uh, after the uh, lecture. Uh, would you like to? Any, anyone? Uh, Dr. Chong Hua, you have a question? Uh, this is not my own question. The lady who sit in front, she just uh, have to leave the room for the lecture. And she wants to ask uh, about the vitamin B12. Yes. 
Um, at the time they discovered how to make uh, vitamin B12 from living materials, how did they characterize or identify the structure of this vitamin? Which technique have been used to characterize it? Uh, first, the initial determination of the structure of natural vitamin B12 was done by Dorothy Hodgkin. She got the Nobel Prize for that in, uh, at the beginning of the 60s, uh, Dorothy Hodgkin. Uh, she was a very famous crystallographer and determined the crystal structure of the natural vitamin B12. So this characterized the molecule. And then the synthesis was performed by these groups I mentioned. And then you use the normal techniques of physical techniques like infrared spectroscopy, melting points, infrared spectroscopy, NMR spectroscopy, crystallography, and you compare the natural and the artificial, and you see that they're identical. This is the way it has been done. Thank you. Thank you.